since it is the feast of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, how many people know what the Immaculate Conception is at all? At all? I, I live in Ireland where everybody knows. The Immaculate Conception is the, uh, the conception of uh, the BVM, that's the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, she was immaculately conceived. That means she was conceived without sin. All the rest of us were conceived in sin. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but as far as I've been able to uh, research Catholic theology, it means that the church suspects our parents may have had a little fun while they were fucking. Uh, and so we we're all conceived in sin, but uh, apparently uh, Mary's parents were an impotent man and a, and a frigid woman, so she was conceived without sin. Uh, uh, she's the patron saint of Andrea Dworkin, I think. Uh, Andrea Dworkin is the one who used to say that all sexual intercourse between men and women was degrading to the woman. And recently she revised her position. She said it's okay if the man doesn't have an erection at the time. Uh, uh, people laugh at her, but I think she may be the first female pope. Uh, she has, a, she has a definitely papist, uh, a def she could be a Jesuit, she's got... <laughs> Uh, I wonder how many I wonder how many people ever have had intercourse without an erection. Oh well, uh, maybe I'll find out in a few years. Most men my age are dead already, as Casey Stengel once said. Uh, uh, Jesus was conceived without sin, and, his, and it took them 1,900 years to decide his mother was conceived without sin too. That's when the Immaculate Conception was promulgated, was in the 1870s, and uh, at the rate the church is going in another 1900 years they'll decide his grandmother was conceived without sin so it'll go retroactive back to the uh, back to the amoebas and the formless creatures of the featureless void I suppose it's only that one line the rest of us are all conceived in sin and anyway the um, the feast of the Immaculate Conception is an appropriate uh, evening to uh, uh, consider the subject of religion for the hell of it uh, I, th I think it's really a wonderful, a remarkable uh, tribute to, um, to humanity that we've had for 2,000 years. We've had a religion that's basically uh, based on the idea that a Jewish girl who got mysteriously pregnant was able to convince her husband that a pigeon did it. Uh, and uh, people have been repeating this for, uh, for nearly 2,000 years, and a lot of them have been believing it. And uh, to realize how remarkable that is, just, just imagine if uh, uh, some woman you know suddenly started swelling, and you said, oh, uh, expecting that. Eh? And she says, yes, but it was a pigeon. Uh, somehow the fact that it happened 2,000 years ago, some people are willing to believe it. That's, uh, that illustrates Voltaire's general principle. The, uh, the only way to get any conception of what mathematicians mean by infinity is to consider the extent of human stupidity. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, he's written a commentary on the Koran, and in it he, uh, he says Allah is uh, very vehemently opposed to divorce. The Ayatollah has, is on very intimate terms with Allah, and he knows what Allah thinks about just about everything. And uh, the Ayatollah takes up a lot of hard cases, just like Thomas Aquinas. Uh, I admire theologians who are willing to deal with hard cases. Uh, they produce remarkable results that uh, inspire a great deal of the satire in my books. Uh, the Ayatollah takes up the case of a man who's in the habit of sodomizing camels. And uh, he demonstrates that even in that case, the wife does not have any legitimate grounds for divorce. I mean, this guy may give her something worse than AIDS, but she married him, so she's stuck with him. However, the Ayatollah believes Allah has some sense of uh, relativity. Allah will grant the woman a divorce if her husband is in the habit of sodomizing her brother. And uh, this, this, may, this may sound like surrealism or something, but it's rigorous logic. <laughs> the theologians always use rigorous logic. And uh, the reason it sounds like a lot of Catholic theology is that both uh, Thomist theology and Islamic theology were very heavily influenced by uh, Vence, uh, Ibn Sena, a uh, great uh, Sufi theologian who tried to systemize uh, 
the Islamic system. And uh, the, the reason it's uh, better to sodomize a camel than your brother-in-law, th th those of you who have been wondering whether you should try sodomy or then, uh, not, uh, and when you should start and who you should start with, um, according to the Ayatollah, it's much better to, st to bugger a camel than your brother-in-law. Because you see, if you're stopping a camel, that's only a sin uh, on your part, and you're not corrupting another soul, because camels don't have any souls. But if you bugger your brother-in-law, you're leading him into sin too. And uh, so you see the whole thing makes sense. <laughs> Every, uh, that's the wonderful thing about religion, it all makes sense. If, if you grant the original premise. Uh, the, the, pope, uh, the Pope says, uh, the Pope is on intimate terms with God too, only his God isn't named Allah. His God has an unpronounceable name. He's got a Jewish God. Considering the record of anti-Semitism of the Catholic Church, that in itself is astounding that they got a Jewish God and they hate the Jews. But uh, their God is going to name something like Yahweh or Yahweh or something like that, and he's against divorce too. Now he's even more vehemently against divorce than, the, than Allah. According to the Pope, God doesn't approve of divorce in any case, no cases whatsoever. And the church is very Aristotelian. When they say no cases, they mean no cases. So a Catholic uh, male can bugger all the camels he wants and his brother-in-law on weekends. Uh, he, he, can go, he can go out with whores every night and he can come home drunk and beat his wife up and sexually abuse his children and give his wife a case of AIDS and she still can't divorce the bastard because to, uh, to the church, no, uh, no divorce means no divorce. You see, the Ayatollah is really a flaming liberal compared to the Pope. Uh, I, I should say the Catholic Pope because there are around 8 million Popes in the world today. Uh, a fact for which I am largely responsible. I, uh, I'm a Pope myself. As a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, for those of you up front here, you see, there's my Pope card, right? The bearer of this card is a genuine and authorized Pope, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't have to have a Pope card to be a Pope. Uh, when we started out, this, this, is, uh, this is part of uh, one of the New Age religions that I helped found. A lot of people get involved in New Age religions. And the, uh, here's another Pope card. <laughs> Okay, shall we do the old walk commercial? Hold up your Pope cards. <laughs> Only two in the house? Oh, well, that's okay. I'm going to make you all Popes automatically right now anyway. <laughs> Spectacles, testicles, brandy, cigars. Okay, you're, you're all Popes now. <laughs> Origin, this is a Discordian uh, institution. The, the Discordian Society, uh, and I, I belong to the lunatic fringe of the Discordian Society, which is the, the paratheo animate mysticot of a res esoteric, which some of you may have heard of. That's uh, abbreviated P-O-E-E -E and pronounced Pui. Uh, this, this was founded when my good friend Malaclips the Younger was in a bowling alley in York. Belinda, California, where, where Richard Nixon grew up. You see, it's all one seamless web, as, as Alan Watts used to say. And uh, originally, uh, Mal was printing Pope cards and distributing them, and I started doing that too. And then I got the idea of writing a novel and including a Pope card in the novel, so everybody who owned the novel would be a Pope. And so since the novel sold about a million copies so far, I've created a million popes that way. And then Margot Adler repeated the Pope, reprinted the Pope card in her book, Drawing Down the Moon, which is about matriarchal religions in the United States. And so all the readers of her book became popes just by having the Pope card in their book in their possession. And uh, then just recently, the, uh, the guy in Rome who still thinks he's the only pope, 
Uh, he announced that uh, cardinals could uh, give indulgences over television, <laughs> which, uh, which is something entirely new. The church is adapting to the modern technological age, and uh, now a cardinal can get up on television and give an indulgence, and everybody who has the set turned on gets the indulgence by electronic osmosis or something. And this, this led to a lot of debate in Fook and Dublin. Uh, the Fook and Dublin has the most uh, argumentative and subtle atheist in the world. That's, the, that's the, one of the results. It's one of the inevitable byproducts of Jesuit education. The Jesuits educated the Marquis de Sade and uh, Diderot and Voltaire and uh, James Joyce and... Uh, hmm? Jerry Brown. Jerry Brown. I, well, I don't know about that case. Uh, but they are very good at producing intellectually intricate atheists along with the herd of true believers that they set out to produce. And the atheists in Dublin and started writing letters asking for clarification of uh, the indulgences by television. If you make a videotape, one of them asked, and you play it over and over, do you get perpetual indulgence? <laughs> And uh, I, I wrote in to suggest that anybody who did that could come to San Francisco and get honorary membership in the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. But they didn't print that, evidently, because nobody in fucking Dublin got that reference. But uh, I, I decided if they can do... Uh, indulgences over television, I can do pontifications over television and radio. So whenever I'm on a TV or a radio show, I make the whole audience popes at some point during the show. So I've created over nine million popes now. And they're all equally infallible because all Discordian popes are equally infallible and they all disagree with one another. I was on a radio show in England and uh, with eight other guests. It was one of those round-robin talk shows and there was a Scotsman there who was a designer of bagpipes in the traditional style. I told him my father-in-law said a bagpipe was something an Irishman gave a Scotsman and told him it was a musical instrument. And, uh, but he makes really classic bagpipes. And after he heard about my uh, uh, pan pontification project, the effort to make every man, woman, and child on the earth a pope, he told me I should send a pope card to Ian Paisley right away. <laughs> Ian Paisley is the leader of the Protestant uh, bigots in Northern Ireland. His slogan is, no pope in Ulster. <laughs> so I made Ian Paisley a pope. Uh, which, uh, and he hasn't left Ulster yet. He doesn't have the simple honor to skulk away like he should now that he's a pope. I also sent the pope card to the anti-pope in southern France, which makes him a pope and an anti-pope at the same time, which, which means he can get into the next, he can get into Hofstadter's next book as a living strange loop. Uh, the uh, the Discordian, I, I, should, I should explain Discordianism to you a little. Uh, Aris is uh, the goddess of chaos, discord, confusion, bureaucracy, and international relations. And right away you see we've got a winner here, because if you look around the world, what do you see the most of? Chaos, discord, confusion, bureaucracy, and international relations. So it's obvious that Aris is the most powerful divinity at this point in history. The, uh, the, the basic Discordian uh, theology is that all of our problems began with the original snub. They, they were having a party on Olympus and they didn't invite Aris. <laughs> And so she got so ticked off that she made a beautiful golden apple. Some say it was metallic gold, some say it was Acapulco gold. Uh, Discordian popes all disagree with each other. But whatever kind of gold it was, she threw it into the party and she wrote on it, she had written on it, Kalisti, which is Greek for, for the prettiest one. And so all the goddesses started arguing over which one should get the apple, which one was the prettiest one. Just like Nancy complaining about Raisa being better dressed than her. Uh, some things are eternal. And uh, the goddesses got into such a terrific fight that the only way to settle it was for Zeus to pick a mortal to make the decisions. So he picked Paris, and all the goddesses tried to bribe him. Athena offered him wisdom, and Minerva offered him security, or something like that. And uh, Venus, who was the Sharpie in the bunch, and she offered him Helen of Troy. So there was no doubt how he was going to uh, uh, vote. And uh, that led to the Trojan War, and ever since then we've had chaos, discord, confusion, bureaucracy, and international relations. And it all derives from the original snub. 
Now, I think that's as good a theology as you can find anywhere in the hate, and uh, I hope you're all happy being Discordian popes. Uh, it may seem oversimplified, but we've got the symbolic dodge. We, we've read T.S. Eliot, you see. It's more like a great poem than like a scientific statement. That's what Eliot said about the Anglican Church, so we say it about Discordianism. You don't have to take it literally. Eris is just a symbol of the second law of thermodynamics. However, we do have our own metaphysics. The basic metaphysics of the Discordian society is all affirmations are true in some sense, false in some sense, meaningless in some sense, true and false in some sense, true and meaningless in some sense, false and meaningless in some sense, and true and false and meaningless in some sense. And if you repeat that 666 times, you, you will achieve supreme enlightenment. In some sense. Actually, Discordianism was inspired by Kirby Hensley, who started out in the 1950s to make, every, to make as many clergy entities as possible. You notice I again avoided human chauvinism, I didn't say clergy persons. And as a matter of fact, Hensley has ordained parrots, chimpanzees, dogs, cats. Uh, he ordained Madeleine Murray O'Hare, the country's leading atheist. And he doesn't charge for it. He'll ordain anybody. That's why he calls it the Universal Life Church. He believes that uh, every sentient being has the right to be a clergy entity. <laughs> and so he's been uh, sending out these ordinations through the mail since the 50s. And uh, they're free. If you want to get a doctor of divinity, he charges for that. That's $20. If you're satisfied just being a clergy person, that's free. If you want to be a doctor of divinity, it's $20. But he, he's done more to raise the, the quality of religion in the United States than anybody in our time. As soon as you get ordained by him, you have all the rights of clergy, and you can start your own sect. Or sex, if you prefer the plural. I always prefer sex myself, but uh, the... Uh, when, when he decided to make every uh, living uh, being a uh, clergy entity, that's what inspired uh, the Discordian movement to make every uh, entity a pope. Uh, Hensley has ordained, quite, he ordained me, he ordained my, my, my friend Malaclips the Younger, the chief Discordian atheologian, and uh, he ordained the founder of the Reformed Druids of North America. Uh, that's, that's a group that started at a college in uh, Indiana in the 1950s. At that college, they still had compulsory church attendance. You had to go to some church or other. They didn't care which, but you had to go to some church once a week. So a bunch of free thinkers on the campus announced that they were druids and started going to the woods every week. And, uh, they, they took along a bottle of Irish mist, which they claimed was their sacrament. And uh, after a while, they started getting interested in druidism, and they started doing druid rituals. And then they found out the chief druid ritual was human sacrifice. So, so they quickly changed their name to the Reformed Druids before anybody would get nasty ideas about them. They, they sacrifice a branch off a tree in their rituals. And then they extended it to the Reformed Druids of North America when they got some converts in Canada. Now they got groves all over the United States. There's one over in Berkeley called the Nut Grove, which I, I think is a lovely name for a new religion, the Nut Grove of the Reformed Druids of North America. I, I, got, or I got, after getting ordained by Hensley and, by, and made a pope by Malaclips, I uh, got initiated by the Reformed Druids, and I immediately formed a heresy. <laughs> the Reformed non Aristotelian Druids of North America, or RNA DNA. Uh, the, the, reformed, uh, the Reformed Druids, uh, in their ceremonies, you have to repeat three times nature is good, nature is good, nature is good. And as a non Aristotelian disciple of Alfred Korzymski, I don't believe in the is of identity. I believe that's what we're projecting outward, what are internal evaluations in our nervous system. So I formed uh, the reformed non Aristotelian Druids of North America, and we say, Nature seems good to me. Nature seems good to me. Nature seems good to me. Uh, and 
we avoid all that Aristotelian metaphysics of assuming we know the true na the true essence of reality. The, the reformed the non-Aristotelian Druids, uh, since I founded it, has tripled in membership. There are three of us now. <laughs> But then, but then I met Dr. Horace Naismith, a good old boy from Texas. He's the founder of the Dope and Guns Party, which, which should be the most successful political party in the United States, but for some reason it isn't. He, he may not have the right approach in his uh, campaign literature. It's Dr. Naismith's notion that all the gun nuts are terrified the government's trying to take their guns away. You know, you've seen those bumper stickers, they'll take my gun away when they pry my cold, dead fingers from the barrel. Of the and if guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns, which always remind, always makes me think of nukes are outlawed, only outlaws will have nukes. Or the, the great paradox of anarchism, if laws are outlawed, only outlaws will have laws. <laughs> Then there's the then there's the other haunting there's the other haunting thought if marriage is outlawed only outlaws will have in-laws. <laughs> Well, the gun nuts are pretty agitated about the <laughs> continuous plotting in Washington to take their toys away from them. And, uh, you know, as John Lennon said, happiness is a warm gun. And as Mark Chapman said, happiness is John Lennon in your gun sights. Da down in... Uh, down in L.A. now, they've taken to shooting each other on the freeways. If you had a drive in the traffic down there, you might feel that way, too. There are cars down there that have bumper stickers that say, Don't shoot, I'll let you pass. <laughs> this is the most gun-happy country in the world. And yet the damn government is plotting to take away people's simple pleasures from them. And so Dr. Naismith, who, come, who hails from Texas, where everybody has a gun, um, <laughs> He decided to form the Guns and Dope Party. He said if you get all the dopers and all the gun people together, you'd have a majority. <laughs> if they can only get over being paranoid about one another, because most of the dopers don't like the gun people, and most of the gun people are afraid of the dopers. But Dr. Naismith was convinced if he could get them together, they'd be a majority, and we'd uh, have a libertarian-type government again. Somehow it hasn't worked out that way. Much more successful was Dr. Naismith's uh, new religion, the John Dillinger Died for You Society, <laughs> which, uh, of which I am an assistant treasurer. Uh, that entitles me to collect dues from anybody dumb enough to think that it's worth jo while joining the John Dillinger Died for You Society. John would have wanted it that way. <laughs> The John Dillinger Died for You Society is a kind of splinter off the Libertarian Party with the theological connotations. It's the basic teaching of the Dillinger, John Dillinger Died for You Society that St. John the Martyr, as we call him, he proved that even in hard times, even during a depression, a real man doesn't have to go with his hand out to the government and ask for the dole. A real man can go out and make money his own way. Or as John said in his own words. Praise John. Praise John. As John said, you can get more with a simple prayer and a Thompson submachine gun than you can get with a simple prayer alone. <laughs> John robbed 23 banks and three police stations. Uh, the, the banks were his way of dealing with his financial problems in the Depression, and everybody had pro financial problems then. I think robbing the police stations was art for art's sake, which is, which is another thing that makes John uh, such an appeal. That, that and the, the legend that he had a 23-inch penis, I bet even in this generation a lot of people have still heard that. that. That seems to be one of those undying bits of folklore. When I was at Playboy, I I persuaded the uh, the uh, editorial director that we should do a feature in the Playboy Advisor on is it true that John Dillinger had a 23-inch penis? The the legend is that it's uh, preserved at the Smithsonian <laughs> Institute in an alcohol bottle, and you have to know high government officials to be allowed to say it. <laughs> now the uh, the women in the uh, Playboy research department are a pretty hard-boiled lot. I mean, working for an outfit like that, 
uh, calling the Kinsey Institute constantly for information about odd sexual practices and whatnot. They, they, it's, not, it's not easy to embarrass them. But the researcher who got this job was really embarrassed. She thought this was the most ridiculous thing she ever had to do. And I happened to be, she had an office right next to me, and I heard her on the phone at, at the Smithsonian. She said, I'm a researcher at Playboy magazine, and I feel like an absolute idiot about what I'm about to ask you. And then there was a pause, and she said, how many? And the fellow on the other end said, you're going to ask about Dillinger's penis? We get 17 calls about that every week. <laughs> no, we do not have it in a jar. But of course, that's what they would say if they're keeping the relic and showing it only to high government officials. Who knows, maybe Gorbachev got to see it, but they won't let, like, the, like the killer rabbit that attacked Jimmy Carter. There are some things the government doesn't want to share with us. Um, the, uh, the, the Dillinger Society has its own mantra, uh, which